You're listening to the Amador View Podcast, and I am your host, Dana Kalman. Kids that are loved at home go to school to learn. Kids that don't have that love at home sometimes go to school to be loved or cared about. None of our students have tested positive for it this, so far, even though some of them have had family members that have. All right, everybody. Hey, I uh, wanted to welcome you all to our very first podcast episode of the Amateur Review. And my name is Dana. Dixon. I live here in Ion, and I have a couple of uh, friends here on the line. We're just going to talk a little bit today about Amador County Unified School District, um, some of the challenges that we face uh, through COVID, and uh, currently right now our kids just went to distant learning. So I uh, just kind of want to talk a little bit about that and see where everybody stands on it. I have two kids in the district. I have a, my biological son. He's 14 years old. He attends Ion Junior High School. And uh, he's in eighth grade. And then my stepson, who lives with us full time, he is uh, nine years old, and he's in third grade at Ion Elementary. When we first moved here in 2016, my son uh, started at Ion Elementary, and then I had to pull him out of Ion Elementary and homeschool him for two years over at Mount Mount. And then we returned to Ion Junior High in sixth grade. I really like school at Ion Junior High. He's great, and he's been just helping to facilitate my son's IEP and everything, but we are having a hard time right now through COVID, and we have definitely had some challenges, and I'm seeing other parents also have challenges. One thing that I saw this past 10 months or so with COVID is that the children are having a really hard time being isolated and not being able to socialize with their friends. So I took it upon myself to do something that a lot of people may not agree with, but we do have a small group of parents who are happy with it. I decided to take every Wednesday and make a little youth group, and I call it Wednesday Club. And we actually meet out at Howard Park in Ione. And I open this up to all ages, kindergarten through 12th grade. And really, I am seeing a lot of kids, you know, ages preschool through fifth grade show up here. We do art, we do science, we do PE. It's really fun. The kids are craving this type of interaction with their peers. And it it really dawned on me as COVID has gone on, I've seen a decline in the mental health of the children, even my own children. But not only that, something that bothered me was that the mental health of the parents is also coming into play. At Wednesday Club, we have the kids, you know, they, they do their projects, but then when they're off playing during free play time, the parents are standing around talking. And what I'm noticing is that the parents are sharing with each other some of the struggles that they're going through. And seeing their kids struggle is hurting them too. Uh, having people home from work, not working, having financial difficulties, it's really, really stressful on the family. And I think that when you have parents who are struggling emotionally and financially, that rubs off on the kids and vice versa. Now, some, the reason why I'm bringing up Amador County Unified School District in this is because I do not see any talk from the superintendent about mental health. I've had 36 emails come to my email box since March, and a lot of them are titled Health and Safety Plan but not one time has it ever talked about mental health. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. I decided to do this podcast because I've been listening to the school board meetings and I haven't heard one word about mental health except for the last meeting. I did hear uh, James Marzano talk about it a little bit, which was great. I'm really glad that he brought that up, Uh, but still there's really no plan. So something that I I wanted to, uh, to bring up. And we do have two parents here. We have uh, Paula and Brenda are here. They kind of share some of the same concerns. So I kind of wanted to ask you ladies if, have you seen any type of dwindling down um, or any struggles of mental health in any of the kids, your, your own kids or your friend's kids with being isolated in the house? I'll give you an example of my children, uh, personal hygiene has become a huge issue because they're not on a regular schedule. 
And if you have teenagers, you know that personal hygiene is a struggle that parents have on a daily basis. And I am seeing this over and over and over again every day. Not the fight that I want to have with my kids every day, I'll tell you that. Um, I, I've noticed something similar with my son being cooped up for the last year. The hygiene thing, he, he, I don't know, he's pretty good about it because they read, read him the riot act in school. But on all of us, it's kind of gone down a little bit because why? We're not going anywhere. You know, if I'm not yeah, obvious, yeah. if I'm not obviously smelling, you know, and I haven't done something too dirty, I, why change my clothes? I mean, I'm not going anywhere. So that's a definite thing that I see going on. A decline in mental health. We're, we're used to this. We're introverts. We're more used to staying home. So nothing big that I'm noticing. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, our, our kids do, um, they're also introverts. They do stay home uh, a lot. You know, of course, they're video game players. They play the Xbox all the time. But one thing I did notice throughout the last, you know, school year, and gosh, you know, I've really lost track. I know right now we're 100% distance learning. We were hybrid before that. We were distance learning before that. It's kind of flip-flopped back and forth. And then with the kids only going to school during the hybrid model for two days a week, something I noticed there was they were getting very nervous to go to school because they were only going to school two days a week. And so normally if they're going to school five days a week, it's a routine. It's normal. They don't really get nervous. But it's kind of like, um, you know, if a child only sees, um, one of their parents every three or six months and they get very nervous and they get anxiety and they get a stomach ache and they don't really know how to react. That's what I was seeing in both of our kids. They were, um, like I said, very, very nervous to go to school. And I hated seeing that because it's not, it's not normal to me for a child to be nervous and have that anxiety just to go and see their regular peers. That was something that I was definitely concerned about. And the, another thing that came up with us, not just with the kids, but us too, is, um, you know, we're not really getting much exercise. And we've all put on a few pounds during uh, COVID. You know, and I, I, okay, so what? You know, 10, 15 pounds you, you put on. But, you know, for a kid, that might be, you know, it's devastating to them. They might really, you know, being a kid is hard anyways, and you have you know, you struggle with self-esteem, and then you go through that, and uh, I think everything just kind of piles on top of one another, and they end up having a hard time with it. So that was something else that I kind of know. But the other thing I was saying before at Wednesday Club, when we were talking, you know, I had, oh, Diane's here. I'm just going to let her on real fast. Hold on. One moment. Okay, while you're Did that talking, work? Did that, that work? Hi. Hello. Good. Yes, we got you. Uh, I'll kind of bring you up to speed. Okay. So we have Paul Shepard here. We also have Brenda Wilson and me, Dana Calhoun. We're just kind of just reviewing really fast about some of the mental health issues that, you know, they haven't really seen many mental health issues, but, but I have, um, not just in the kids, but also in the parents. And one thing I was just kind of hitting on was the decline in uh, personal hygiene and then also a little bit of weight gain. And um, since the kids aren't going to school five days a week, I've also noticed that they get nervous when they're going to see their so like the hybrid model. We were only going to school two days a week. They would get very nervous, almost like it was their first day of school again. And so um, I was just kind of bringing that up to see if there was if anyone else had noticed any type of mental health issues going on. I've seen a lot of it. Um, some of it. You know, the kids I work with are already at risk youth. So some of it, they won't necessarily say it, but for a lot of kids, school was their two or at least one guaranteed meal a day. It was the place where sometimes, you know, kids that are loved at home go to school to learn. Kids that don't have that love at home sometimes go to school to be loved or cared about you know and yeah. and they'll push their boundaries and stuff too but they have somebody that actually gives them boundaries but yeah we've we've had kids i mean there's some of them that 
we've even talked about trying to figure out if with COVID funds, we could put in a new hot water line and start doing um, within their um, CTE classes, teaching them how to properly do laundry because even though they may know how, they may not have access to it. So their clothes are disheveled and there's one kid that's living in the basement with a brother and sister and six dogs. So no matter if he showers or not, the smell of those animals and whatnot is in his clothes. Mm -hmm. And just missing the years. other kids. I've been saying for years that they need a shower set up in the, a private shower set up and a washer and dryer for the kids that need it. And like 90, 99% of the school wouldn't even know it existed, but the 1%, the 5% that did could bring in their clothes. I've been saying it for years and nobody will do it. Everybody thinks it's a great idea, but nobody does it. I know there's one teacher at one location who does have access to a washer and dryer at the school site and does allow kids to bring in a change of clothes so that they, you know, so they can rotate out their clothes. Mm -hmm. But that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's But they're not implementing that. Really I've never heard of that before, but I mean, that is a good idea. You don't really think of some of the needs that these kids need that they're not really getting at home. School is an extension spot, you know. And sometimes maybe they do have mom and dad at home, but maybe with COVID, I mean, I've seen articles and I've read things where, you know, there was a thing on the news recently where a family's washer broke and they don't have the money to replace it right now. But have you gone to a laundromat and seen what those prices are? So the kid's afraid to get their good clothes dirty or even wear them or whatnot. So it may, it, it could just be something about a broken one or an issue with a water line at a house. And if you're renting, that doesn't mean your landlord's, you know, being a good landlord and gonna fix the things that are broken. Yeah, I, I, you know, I never really thought about that, that's definitely. I mean, you, you think that there's not really that, that type of resource anywhere. I mean, social services, obviously, you know, kids aren't gonna go and reach out to social services. School sometimes is the only safe place that they have. God, I wonder if it, they would even have, um, you know, room for something like that, like at Ion Junior High School or not. I'm sure they could always find room because even if you, if you thought about it, you know, there's no reason why down by the weight rooms and that they couldn't just say, oh yeah, cause like wrestling and basketball and this, that, and the other thing, they use so much stuff instead of the teacher taking towels and stuff home anymore, we've got one on site now so that we can use it. And then it's also for those kids that need to come use it. There, there's ways that these things could go in even like near the locker room so that, you know, getting the hot water to them but some schools don't even have hot water at the sinks anymore when you look at it and it's, oh, we've got a this or that. I'm like, there are those forever hot water heaters anymore, but it's all about funds and it's, you know, bringing this line in and that line in. Wow. Those hot, it, those Insta hots can be dangerous for the young kids and the idiots. And, there's, yeah. and, the, and the idiots come in all ages. Yeah. And you still have to have propane or at least electricity for those. Right, right. That's true, though. But hey, you know that I'm making a note of that. I think that's really interesting. And even um, even if there were even if there was a program for kids who did have that need, what if there was like some type of laundry service where the school district, you know, contracted with a local local laundromat, like that new little one in Ione is so so great. They have a great new owner. She's really really nice, and she's really trying to drum up business right now. You know, what if mm -hmm. they had a contract with her where hey. You know, you had let's say 20 kids 15 20, 20 kids in this program and you know they were assigned to okay you bring your clothes in on monday they'll be ready for you on Tuesday, you know and no one has to know about it it's private you know because a lot of them are embarrassed about that kind of stuff too so it'd be very discreet and uh, Before, I, I think you'd have a, i think you'd have a hard time convincing kids that have three pairs of jeans to give two of them away it and not control them yep you know what i mean and that is part yeah. of the problem. I agree. And then before COVID hit in San Andreas, what happened is one of the churches was sponsoring like a three hour night at the laundromat where if you came in on say Thursday night from five to eight o'clock at night, you could wash and dry your clothes for free. 
but then when COVID hit, they quit doing that because we were handing out the flyers to all of our kids, but then it's still access to get there to, you know, and they may not have transportation or be within walking distance. So they try and try to help, but yeah, if you could, you know, drop off in the morning at, at school without anybody knowing and somebody was hurrying up and doing the loads and making sure that, you know, X kid got X kids clothes back and, or, you know, all of a sudden maybe they're a TA for a period and that's what they get to go do during that TA period is work on their laundry and learning to balance a checkbook and how to do a resume and those career path type classes. And take a shower and have a snack with a microwave and just freaking relax and not worry about anything for that limited m period of time. Exactly. And the, right. and the kids that and the kids that abuse it, they don't get it again. You know, and exactly. I don't I don't think it would be abused. I really don't. I don't think the kids that that really the homeless, the ones that are in the shelter, the foster kids, I don't think they would abuse it. I, mean, I could I be wrong, so but I don't either. No, I don't think that they would. And if they could do it discreetly, you know, I'm just trying to put myself in their position. Hey, you know, I if I'm allowed to do it twice a week, I throw a small bag in my backpack with maybe, you know, five or six items. I drop it off at the office, you know, or whatever. Someone takes it, does does it that day, brings it back to me at the end of the day. And no one's going to know about it. My clothes are clean. I didn't have to, you know, I already had clothes to wear that day. So if I only have two pairs of jeans, like you said, you know, I get the, a new fresh pair for the next day. And that's, uh, you know, it's pretty nice. As we're talking about this, I even thought about it one step further. So 90% of the kids, especially at least their freshman year, and, and they've been carrying it through, have a study hall period. So then the counselors maybe know who the kids are that need that. And one day a week, they plan with those kids that they're going to pull them out for counseling during their study hall session. And they go to whatever building that is, and they can learn to do their own clothes so they can see that they're staying with them you know and that way they they feel comfortable with doing it and getting it done right it would you be know? a home ec class but only yeah. the difference is instead of cooking it would be the other everything else you know when i was in seventh grade and remember i didn't go to school up here went to school down in the bay area in los gatos we had a skills class it was like a life skills class and uh, we learned so much in there there was a textbook there was a, a consumable consumables book we learned how to talk to people properly. Uh, we learned how to do all kinds of stuff. And I always thought, gosh, I've never seen that class ever again anywhere. And I would love to do something like that or put together a curriculum and, and implement it. I, I think even one semester, whether it's junior high or high school, it's, it's something that would be very helpful. I know, you know, like Bonnie, she works at uh, Trillia up there, and, but that's for adults and it's special ed. There are kids that are not special ed that still need those skills. They do not have those skills. You know, their parents might not mm -hmm. make them do laundry. It's really not and you learn to cook. And you learn to cook, too. There, there are plenty of parents who have a lot of money, and they don't cook, and they don't teach their kids how to cook because they don't want to cook, you know? So it's not necessarily... Um, so it was a semester. We, um, we started cooking, and it was whatever all of us could kind of gather together for that. We, we did things like learning how to hard boil an egg or learning how to boil pasta so that the kids could make spaghetti or mac and cheese. And we just did some simple things, but then I also made it a nutrition portion where like they had to sit there and I gave them an amount, like everybody had $15 to plan a dinner for four people. And you had to have um, basically a salad and an entree and maybe even a dessert and they had to go shopping and look up the prices of the stuff and see what they could do so they had to learn to budget and one of the kids came back with they were using top ramen noodles for their spaghetti because then they could come back and um, have more money for towards dessert and they wanted whatever it was for dessert but they were so creative it was wonderful and you know we might think you need this but they can come up with an alternative and it just shows the resilience of the kids right so that they're thinking about it they're they're interested i think that's great i love that i love mm -hmm. that yeah 
Okay, I'm going to switch gears here really fast. Um, I want to kind of uh, talk a little bit about how Amador County decided to go back to full distance learning. Just, I I'm looking at my calendar right now trying to figure out where I'm at. Say some second. So it was, I think the, correct me if I'm wrong, we got an email on December 10th, and I got this email at 3.30 in the afternoon uh, from the district stating that we were going back to a full distance learning model and that was going to start on the 14th. Now, I understand that uh, some of the board members were not very happy with that because they were not consulted. And there's a ed code or whatever you call it, um, 2210 or something like that, where the superintendent can make those types of decisions in an emergency situation. That's where my, my question is, is what exactly is the definition of that emergency situation? Because in this email, it stated that the kids were going to go to full distance learning the following Monday on the 14th. However, the kids were still in school on the 11th. So how much of an emergency was this if the kids were still in school on Friday? And then the second part of my question, if you guys can help me out with this a little bit, is the fact that it, first I understood it to be a COVID issue, but then when we finally got to the board meeting, which was, gosh, I don't know, maybe the 14th, it was admitted that it's actually a staffing issue due to COVID. And that brings up a whole bunch of questions. You know, that board meeting was very interesting on, on Monday because uh, as I was kind of reading through the code, I also saw that it stated that if the superintendent does make a decision like that, it is supposed to be on the next agenda for discussion. I did not see it on the agenda for discussion. Maybe I missed it, but the only time that it was discussed was during the superintendent's report. To me, a report is not a discussion with the board. Sure, she allowed people to comment on her report, but to me, a report is a one-way conversation. That is not a discussion between board members. And so I was just going to see, um, you know, if I maybe get some of your guys' input on that because uh, I I wasn't I wasn't happy about it because I thought that the board had some type of say in what was going on. I didn't feel like it was an emergency. I felt like it was due to poor planning, not allowing people to come in and, and sub. I, I think you're right. I think it was definitely poor planning. But my kid went to school that Tuesday. And we, I'm not going to give you all the details, but we really, my kids in 10th grade, we really screwed up with the system because one of my kids' days was packed with one particular class for like four hours. So anyway, I, w I was already fudging the system. So when Mr. Critchfield said we had no idea where kids were, it's because some kids were actually on campus for some classes and doing, d logging in distance learning for other classes. So amateur high, everybody was screwing with everybody. So anyway, I had already decided that my kid wasn't going back for Friday. So I was, I was relieved. But I know that staff and everybody else were in full panic mode that, that, that we're not ready. We can't do this. We're, we're, under, we're overmatched. We're understaffed. We don't have the cleaning. We don't have nothing. We're not giving our duties, not getting paid for our duties. So I, 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 was, glad, I was glad that they stopped it. And my kid's yeah. not going back to hybrid, and and hopefully that leaves room for some other kid. Yeah, the way I understood it was that they knew that they were going to need so much staff, um, you know, because the people are exposed, they have to go on, you know, isolation or quarantine. And, uh, and so they did not open up those jobs to anybody outside of the teacher when they should have. And so when the teachers, you know, this big boom of COVID came, you know, it hit our house too. Everybody went out at the same time and there, were, there was no backup. And so in the board meeting, actually the new president, Kent, Kenny Thompson, she asked the superintendent, well, hold on a second, why, you know, why didn't we hire anyone? She said, well, it's because um, we had to allow the teachers to have first pick on that type of overtime or whatever they want to call it. And she said, okay, well, now you're asking, now you're saying that you need people to be working those shifts. So how can people apply? And he was kind of stumped. He said, oh, well, you'll have to give us a few days to get that organized. So you, all, you already pulled people out. You, you already shut down schools, went to distance learning because of this problem. But you had no plan on trying to hire people even before or even after this emergency took place. 
that's what really got me. It, it was almost like, uh, yeah, we know that it happened, but we have no intention on trying to fix it. That was a problem that, that I had with it. But, but we all knew that was going to happen. Nothing that Slavinsky has touched the entire time she's been here has ever turned out. Literally, nothing. So I, I don't understand how five people could think that, you know, when they said, here, Slavinsky, we believe you, we'll tell you the what, and you'll figure out the how. I mean, that was asinine. She's never figured out the how on anything. So, been, uh, so I got mixed emotions on that about that board. Right. Yeah, it seems the board's changed a little bit. Seems like we have, um, you know, not. I don't want to use like say it's a split board, but the board is different opinions now, which I think is a good thing. You know, because we need a little bit more than just a one-sided conversation up there. You know, I think now maybe people are a little bit more open to to speaking up, and it looks like that that's good for us at least. You know, we have two different sides of the spectrum. So with that said, we, without with the poor planning and everything. Uh, you know, like I said before, I'm wondering if that was a sabotage, if that was done on purpose. We have no intention on hiring substitutes. We're sitting here telling you that we really need people and to go and apply, but but not until she's actually pressed on the issue does she admit that she doesn't even have the system to hire them. They don't even have these jobs. That to so when she comes back and says that we're going to go Love back it. to the pool, how are we going to go back to school on January 7th and 8th into a hybrid model if they just started, if they just opened up the hiring a few days ago and we have Christmas break this week? How are we going I to was gonna, to I was going to say it's during Christmas break, so I don't think anybody from the district office is in there going through those people that are on those applications. I could be completely wrong. I, 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 <clears throat> I actually know that the uh, district office is being staffed very minimally. I know that Demi was there, um, I believe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday with uh, either Sean, Jared, or Vicari, but they're taking turns over this week and next. They're taking the two days off for, you know, they're, they're having two four-day weekends, but they will be there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And that may I, be on their contract. I drove by and I saw the cars in the parking lot is all I can tell you. Okay. Well, and that may, you know, their contract versus teacher contracts are different because teacher contracts are usually 185 days, but the, the, the staff at the district office has much more days on their contract than teachers do. So 220. <laughs> okay. Well, but I do, I do know that it's possible, but they, but like I, like I put on my post, I, I'm not saying that they have any way of getting their TB tests and they're getting their, which is bogus or getting their, you know, their uh, clearance or whatever it is. They, I don't know, understand how they can do that in two weeks. Over they have the clearance. They have the machines for the DOJ clearance to do the fingerprints at the district office. At least they used to, to send uh, in to the DOJ. You're right. They did. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll follow up on that and I'll, I'll, I'll find out and I'll answer you privately and then you can tell people. But okay. I'll find out about that one. I know somebody I can ask on that one. Well, and I do know, and um, I can personally state that there are jobs that are listed on there that have been listed for months that people have not heard anything back on. It shows on EdJoin that it has been received. It shows on EdJoin that it has been district viewed. And and they have not been called back at all. And the one I'm speaking of is the adult ed that they needed somebody for for hours. And I can tell you personally, yes, I applied for it, as did one of my coworkers. And she's a special ed teacher. So they could have utilized her in multiple different ways. And they did not, neither of us has been contacted at all. Usually I at least get the kiss off email. Well, well, it does. I mean, does anybody know? I don't know who does the hiring or who is in charge of that department. But you know, I don't even know if they're on vacation. I, we don't even know if those people are being manned at the office because I do know that there's a skeleton crew. Yeah. So well, this has know, been in two know. months. This has been in over well, two months. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Mm, yeah. Diane, your teacher. Have you heard anything from your teachers' unions? 
you know, persuading you guys to stay out of school or, or going back to school? Have they when we went life? back in, when we went back in August, our CTA rep was, I don't know how I want to say this. I, I got to think of how I'm going to say this. Our teachers, the, the rep from CTA was very concerned about our safety of us going back. And she was very deliberate in making sure that, you know, we, we were realizing that we were one of the only schools going back and we were under a very small bargaining unit. So we didn't affect, we, we, ours was only with one other school. Um, but at the same time, the other school was being pushed very much so to say that they didn't feel comfortable but when we took a survey of our very small staff, all of us was more were more concerned about the we were more concerned about the mental health of our students than we were concerned about for our own health. And we said, we're going to try this. We're going to go back full mask. We're going to do the sanitizing in between whether or not we have a janitor to do it. Us teachers are going to do it because we're going to do it for our students. And so we had to send an email stating all this stuff to them and that our us as a group had decided we were going to do it whether it was the recommendation of the cta or not so then they finally so backed off person come up with their recommendation though aren't they supposed to be rec aren't they supposed to be representing the teachers they were rep a representative CTA for across the state myself and another teacher from my school are bargaining unit reps and we went with what our teachers said not with what the state was saying okay because we felt you know we're a little bit different ball game you know we don't have we have a max of 30 students we have large classrooms to begin with and five teachers that we can split the kids between and then even at that, we had students that because of a family member or whatnot chose to do distance learning. So, you know, we, I don't think we've had more than 13 students on campus at a time. So it, it is apples and oranges in some cases, but at the same time, we're kind of that small test case to see. And we had a couple of scares where kids, like you said, didn't feel good or had a cough so they had to go get a COVID test. None of our students have tested positive for it this, so far, even though some of them have had family members that have, but we have not had it at our school to this date, knock on wood. That's good. As I understand it, as far as COVID exposures and everything at Amador County, uh, all the kids that were tested positive, including ours, uh, didn't expose anybody on campus. So there was no exposure there. I think it might've been some teachers exposed outside of the campus, but we didn't have any. But I'm wondering how many students were exposed when transportation shut down, but kept the bus drivers that had been exposed working that day or for the next couple of days. Oh yeah, what exactly happened with that? I only got bits and pieces. I did read a, a social media post about that. A lady had, who was a bus driver stated that she had, she was, she didn't test positive. She had symptoms. Is that right? And she told no, no, no. that she had The one that I read um, was one that had gone into work Monday morning and to find out that the office was pretty much closed and they sent the mechanics home. And I'm just going off of what my remembrance is, so I may not get all of this exactly right. But she was told to go to one of the sites and help with some cleaning, even though she had potentially been exposed. And she chose to use her own sick time to say, no, I'm not working today. Then, you know, I'm going to take a sick day and went to go get tested. And a couple days later, she posted on social media that she had just left Sutter Amateur after being positive for both COVID and pneumonia. And had she gone to the site like they told her, she would have potentially exposed how many other numbers of people. But that's not to say that all the bus drivers that had been exposed did the same thing as she did, because then we would have heard something about massive transportation issues that day. Right. I didn't hear anything. 
I can I can send you some screenshots or the links. Okay. And she's a long. Them. She's been a bus driver for years in this county. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of touch on you know the distance learning versus hybrid and what we're doing. I'm still very curious if we're going to go back on January seventh or eighth. My opinion I is it should have gone to the board. I I think that the superintendent jumped. Um, had she waited another day, it may it might have come down from the health department. And like you said, you cited that ed code that does say in an emergency, but it would be really nice if there was clarifications what that emergency was. What information did she have that made it an emergency that night? Had the health department already called and said, we're going to be doing this the next day, then why didn't she leave it in their hands instead of taking it into her own? Right. And it was also done, well, on the 10th, on Thursday afternoon. It seemed and the kids were still allowed to go on Friday, so obviously there weren't any staffing issues on Friday. I know uh, for my there's been I'm gonna I'm gonna interject there. There's been staffing issues since day one. The sites have been just been told to cover it. I mean, my kid, my kid alone. That's why I was hybriding my own situation was because my kid would I my kid didn't even tell me. I, I was told it was happening, and my kid confirmed it. That kids would just be like, "Oh no, you're not going to Spanish. You're going to the you're going to the cafeteria," and and there's nothing wrong with Jim the janitor, but Jim the janitor is going to be the one supervising you for for the next 45 minutes. Oh, I, I mean, it was that. they they were so understaffed. They had nobody doing they 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 had everybody running around and nobody because you know how it is. Nobody had the the. the balls to say anything because nobody wanted to be the one that said something mm -hmm. and right. complain yeah, so I, this, the, I can assure you I can't I can't prove it to you and I can't name names but I can assure you that staff has been running scared at least in a couple of sites for since November oh I believe it <laughs> I believe that too I mean I, I did hear a couple of staff members who were at the elementary school say uh yeah everyone's running around or you know we had chickens and pets put off this year you know we've had people you know, through administration of years but let me just kind of rephrase what you said you said that they're actually social on staff that kids were told they could not go to their class and they're put somewhere else to be basically babysat by somebody else during that school Yes, I believe if you call any mother of a high school amateur high parent and ask them if their kid was ever sent to either the cafeteria, which I don't understand why the cafeteria, my kid said it was the gym, but I've heard both, um, to the gym just for, just and, and told you were going to study hall. And you go, no, I'm supposed to go to English. And they go, yeah, I know, you're going to study hall. So I'm sure. And the kids, and the kids don't say anything. I mean, my own kid didn't tell me. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's insane to me because she just right. did what she was told. Exactly. But I'm curious when that was happening because if it was, ha that seems like a, a big red flag. And so if, if that was happening, I would think that there would be an emergency bill being called during that time, like the first time that that would have happened, you know? There was no emergency. And, and, and there's nobody, but there's nobody for the staff, the principal, the teachers, anybody to go to. They can't go to the board because the board looks at them and goes, hey, it's not about the what, it's about the how, and Savinsky's in charge of the how, so you deal with Savinsky. I mean, they have no, they have no, they have no support. They have no, nothing to go to. The, the unions aren't there for them. They got nothing. Yeah, I didn't know uh, did, was the union at the last board meeting? Maybe I tuned out for that. Yes, he was. He he. That is how Mr. Dugan got to say as much as he got to say, because otherwise it's a three-minute limit. And what um, Hunkins, I think it is, he comes up and he does because he can have all the time in the world. So he comes up and he says, "I'm I'm here to present Mr. Dugan." That's why Mr. Dugan got all that time. Okay. Now that is something interesting that I didn't put in my notes here. Um, that was interesting because that actually made the uh, SAC B, and it was on Channel 13 News. Part of that's so because I, until they restated that, they were that was a huge violation of Ed Code. Because as teachers, we have the discretion to grade our classes, and you can't just syrup 
surreptitiously come in and say, all of a sudden, all this work you've done and all the stuff that you've done, all, if your students have a 49, they're passing now. You've taken that out of the teacher who knows these students, knows the work, and it, it's a violation of an ed code. Okay, okay, but okay, thank, you, thank you, Diane, for bringing this up. What was the number before? Because from my all accounts, I can find the number before was 50. Okay, um, and now it's 49? Just I really believe 59%. Let me just interject for one minute because if there's people listening, they might not know what we're talking about. Um, during the school board meeting, it was Mrs. Jason who was in some of the secret our front, I assume, spoke and said he was he was upset Sorry. Normal, have every right to grade their own classes. And what happened was there was a um, an order or directive or whatever you want to call it from the district office and what they decided to do was they decided to lower the standards for grading. Uh, they said that they were giving a lifeline to the students. The teachers are very upset because the teachers feel like they have every right to grade their students. They know what they're doing. They don't need the district office to come in and lower the standards. And so, um, so it did make CBS 13. It said many students across nor um, Northern California are struggling with distance learning. One local school district is changing its grading scale to help some of the students make the grade. Quote, the kids are falling behind, end quote, said Lisa McKee, who has her daughter at Amador County Unified School District who's witnessed the hardships the school has presented during the pandemic and says most families are having a hard time. So anyways, I just wanted to let you guys know that. So sorry, Diane, go ahead. No, you've got it right there. And you know, I've talked with a lot of other um, teachers about this since this came out. So usually 60% is a D minus, 59% is an F. So they were basically giving another whole 10% down to the 49. But as a teacher, we as a whole anyways, have control over our grade books. So say I wanted to change participation, say I wanted to add participation, and then say I wanted to say participation is usually weighted at 10% of their grade. But because of this, now I'm going to go ahead and give a boost and make it worth 15%. Or I know that some of these students on here had a hard time getting online, so I'm going to lessen what the the modules are and make their test higher or lower or way more as a as a teacher you already know that okay that student has an iep i can give them some lead way what the district in that email the way it was stated was doing was taking away some of that and saying okay you know you may know that these students are failing because they chose to never show up. You've reached out 50 times. You've already given the progress report stating that they're in jeopardy of failing. And they were saying that reaching out and sending those, um, those progress reports didn't count anymore either as having let them know that they were failing. And it's like, it has worked that way every year before that. So why are you with a week and a half left of the grading period going to surreptitiously change everything and then basically make teachers feel like we weren't doing our job when we've been doing our job times one two or three because not only are we doing distance learning but we're doing hybrid and we're also doing um some in person or you know you're making up multiple lesson plans and you're rolling with the flow of it and trying to do the best for your your students and then you're being told almost like it's not good enough still that's how I feel as a teacher. And luckily, I don't work for the district. And so I, it doesn't fall under that. But I know I took it and went to the other teachers I work with. And we went to our administrator. And he said that some districts were doing that. But that when it comes down to it, the ed code says we have the final say on the grade. No one else. The teacher of record has the final say. But I, I'd be pretty upset if I was a teacher also. Because you're already taking into those, taking those things into account. You know, exactly. I, you know, and so for someone, for your boss, quote unquote, to come in and change your whole standard is, is kind of like, you know, it's undermining your, your classroom. That's your business. Like you're running your own little business in there and, you, you know, you make the rules. That's, that's just how, how it goes. And you're, you're creating your, your lesson plans and everything around that. So for someone to come in and and totally just bypass everything you've worked so hard to do. It's like, oh, come on, guys. 
And I also felt like it was more of the everybody gets a trophy thing. And then what does that say for the kids that have put in the effort and worked their rears off and gone that extra mile and called the teacher when they didn't understand it or their internet went down or whatever it may be or made sure that they got somewhere where they could be with internet to then all of a sudden a bunch of these kids that you know for one reason or another didn't participate didn't take the initiative now they're passing too and and they just get a pass and i've worked my butt off what does that say to that child you know right and does this come i mean i know everything's about money you know my grandmother taught me that a long time ago <laughs> but um i'm just curious it, it, how does this district how does money play a role in this does the district not get funding if they have a certain percentage of kids failing classes or does it have nothing to do with funding at all i honestly don't know if that has to do with funding other people have told me that it does but i haven't looked it up myself um and I don't know if that has something to do with if some of their WASC accreditations are coming up soon, because WASC, a Western Association of, of Schools, their accreditation, um, that's coming up for a lot of the mother load schools. And so are those pass fail rates going to weigh on how they're accredited in the future? Very possibly so. Are they gonna look at, okay, there was COVID, what modifications did you make? Probably. But if they see a mass amount of students failing, are they gonna go, okay, was it the teachers? Was it the administration? Were these teachers supported? Were these kids supported? Those questions are gonna be flagged because if you do have a, an area that was once doing well and now they're not, you can only blame so much of it on COVID. That's right, you can only blame so much on COVID. And then what about other uh, neighboring districts? Is they're competing for some type of grant or something and that grant is based on grades can they come back and say well hold on a second we're competing against the Amarillo County Unified School District and they lowered their grades they lowered their grading standards so it's not fair and then will that take us out of the running for you know that type of grant and of course it's a hypothetical question but that's where my mind goes is what's going to happen in the future you know how is this going to affect us later on it might not you know, at all but it's the way I think it might not at all, but how is it also going to look to college levels? Um, what are they going to look at with the schools? How is that going to affect your 3.5 to 4.0 students when stuff was now, did they only lower it that 49 to 69 was a D or did they also make changes on what made a, B and C D, you know, all the way down, they're going to be looking at that sort of stuff. Yeah, I definitely think that this, this, I don't know what you want to call it. I know uh, our superintendent did not like the word directive, uh, but to the synonym, I don't really care. Um, she did not like that word. She, she didn't really like the fact that she was being questioned on it. She also didn't like but, the word recall. <laughs> <laughs> that's true too. That's true too. Um, or maybe she, maybe she didn't think about the possibility consequences that could happen you know kind of like i mean what would you call it when something comes down from the district and says we're saying that this is changing our grading policies effective immediately i'd say that's some sort of order or directive but they don't like that because they got called on the ed code violation is my opinion gotcha. because mr so dugan was not yeah. afraid to speak up he luckily has been here for a while and has tenure but that does not mean that as we've seen previously that anything he does now may or may not be more scrutinized but i feel bad for him he was very passionate when he was talking he was you know really upset about it he admitted he's a you know pretty uh, strict teacher but he's also you know very involved with his students oh he is i mean i've seen him at numerous wrestling events and other sporting events he not only is a teacher but he puts his time and effort into the kids and models by doing he's gained their respect and you know some of some of the best classes i had in college were the hardest classes i ever had right well i'll kind of um and on this so i i i put out a survey actually online 
and people are upset because apparently it didn't say that the survey was from me. It looked like it was from the district. I don't know where, why the information I, I put in there that it was from me didn't make it to the survey, but I apologize about that. I went back and on my post stated I'm the one who made the, um, the survey. So uh, it was actually pretty successful. I had um, 73 people fill the survey out. Um, when I took these screenshots of it, which I'll post up, um, I had about 71 people at that point. But I just kind of wanted to read over the um, the results, and I have no idea who took, who took it. it. Doesn't tell me. Um, I I could have had that option to have people give me their name and their email address, but I didn't do that here. I just made it anonymous. So uh, the first question that I that I proposed was. Um, well, it says, it's a statement. I have confidence in the decision made by our, by our superintendent. I want to let you guys know that um, we had about 8% say yes, that they had confidence in our superintendent. And we had 62%, 61.97% say uh, no, that they did not have confidence. And then about 30% that said that they didn't know. So I found that to be interesting. We're still, even after all the stuff that we've gone through and, and the recall and everything, we still don't have much confidence in the superintendent. And then I have another question here that says, how did the recent decision to go to distance, distance learning affect your household? And the way that I set up this question was a little weird, but I, I was curious in how it affected people because I know how it's affected our house. Um, some people said there was about 46% that said that it did not affect um, their household at all, but the rest of it, it affected their household. And one of the questions on here is, did it, did it affect more than one of the above options? 36%. So let me tell you what the other options are. Number one, it affected the parents' work schedule. Number two, it affected their daycare amusements. Number three, it cost the family more money. and Number four, they were unsure how they were going to manage their schedule. And so 36% um, of people said that it affected more than one of those things. So I found, found that to be interesting too. Because I wanted to gauge, you know, what is happening in, in people's world. Um, it affected me. I have to be home, you know, all the time with the kids. I'm lucky that I get to stay home and I get to do that kind of stuff. And my schedule is flexible. You know, my husband's schedule, he obviously works, so um, he just has to work enough. But I think more for us, it affected mental health. So I'm not sure if it affected you guys at all. Did you guys have any effects as far as moving to uh, distance learning? Or are you guys better off? Uh, for, for me personally, no. My husband's a contractor, so um, we've kind of thrived because, uh, not thrived, but we've been okay because everybody's you know repairing their house and doing bathroom remodels and things like that so we've been okay that way um and you know mr turner the amazing uh drama teacher he has been in contact with my kids group of kids since march he never they, oh. they didn't they, they never bro broke they always had zoom meetings and the kids all taught uh mr turner how to figure it out and how to get together but my kid has, has had an incredible support system, 99% because of Mr. Turner. So that was um, was directed by him. Oh, was that directed by him or the school district? It, 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 it was above and beyond to the point where it's, um, it was uh, the drama. The drama kids get together all summer long to practice for plays and do, well, you know, just to get together, but to practice to rehearse for plays that are coming up in the fall and to go over what scripts they're going to do and all kinds of things that they talk to normally throughout the summer. But Mr. Turner, and, and so nobody regulates Mr. Turner. I don't know if you know who Mr. Turner is. No. Uh -uh. But uh, he, he's got to be 174 years old. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was old when I was in school at Amador, and I graduated in 92. He is an icon. He has probably the most years teaching of anybody in this district, but he has a passion for teaching and he has a passion for drama. And some of his students have made it big in Hollywood, but he is, he's just, when Mr. Turner retires, they will never 
ever, ever find somebody that can hold half a candle to him, in my opinion. And I'm going to clarify, the guy already retired. So now he he's tried. coming back. He's already, now he's coming back at that little bitty salary that he could only get, like $37,000 or something. You know, I mean, yeah. it's ridiculous what that man does. But anyway, that's why my kid has been able to remain some kind of what sane because of that bubble. Well, and that's what I've been trying to allude to on my different posts is that I don't understand why that didn't happen with everybody else. Why didn't every, like you did, Dana, you, you know, you found, you found your niche, the Wednesday club, you know, it was one day a week. It was one day a week, but you planned for it all week and your kids were excited and, you know, you found your niche and, you know, know and you guys kept to it. I was waiting for somebody else to do it. And then finally I said, you know, I'm sick of waiting. I'm just going to do it myself. And then that's the first thing that everybody said on the very first day. I couldn't believe what a huge turnout we had. People said, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad you did this. I was thinking about doing the same thing. But, you know, you got everyone has a good idea, but you, ha- you have to implement it, you know. I think people just don't really know how to do it or whatever. I went into it blindly, honestly. I... When I did it, I, I just had this idea. I threw it up on Facebook, and every single person that, that showed up to Wednesday Club, I've never met them before in my life. And we've all become friends now, and all the kids have made friends, you know, friendships and stuff. But um, hopefully there will be other groups like that, you know, that, that come about. I'm glad that Mr. Turner is doing that with his kids. But um, – you know, other kids that are interested in other things, because I'm sure there is a niche in other areas, you know, hopefully that they'll, they'll be able to, to do that. Well, well I mean, over. but I mean, the, the welding kids couldn't get together and weld. How much more COVID safe could you be than welding? <laughs> right. mm-hmm. You're already heard that. <laughs> you know, but I mean, you know, in the basics, why couldn't they do a kitchen? The kitchens were set up. The kitchens are set up six feet apart if you only use half the kitchen. The culinary students could have found, you know, I, there's, there's ways they could have made it work. They could have found little niches to put the kids that didn't really fit anywhere, somewhere. Mm-hmm. And they just yeah. didn't because it, it was different because it was easier just to not. You know, and, that's what so, idea. If we do stay at distance learning and we don't go back to hybrid, why can't they have little groups like that? you know, put together where they are safe distance and everything. It's not going to affect the schedule of the entire district, but like you said, like a cooking, a cooking class. What if they went in there and, and did that and only had, you know, six kids in there at one time? What I haven't understood, and this goes right with that, is, you know, and, and I've continued to take cl- college classes at times, and I've done stuff that has been what, they, what we now call distance learning, but was it a hybrid model or whatnot? where for instance i was in an accounting class through delta college that was offered at delta college in stockton but i was taking it at the community center in jackson with a proctor sitting in that room so my thought had been okay if they did allow small cohorts and say you know most classes have say 35 students so if you divided that by five, you'd end up with what? Nine times. You could have seven kids on Monday, seven on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday that could rotate in there. So they actually have one day a week with their teacher. But those other four days a week, they're sitting at home on their Zoom getting that same lesson plan. So you're actually rotating through. So you have a, a very minimal group in the classroom but the rest on Zoom for that day. And so you set up your camera so that if you're getting up and you're doing the lecture, they're still getting all of that as if they were there. Because part of Dana's question earlier about you know the emotional aspect for the kids and the depression, a lot of these kids that did get to go back to hybrid and were just so excited and sometimes a little trepidation because it was almost like the first day of school every day, the fact that it, when it got yanked out from under them with the order that the superintendent did under the emergency order, a lot of them are probably going to experience a worse depression now. And I've heard from several parents that are like, my kid's absolutely devastated now 
because they got that little bit of socializing with their friends or they got that little bit of hands-on in the classroom and it was almost like that teaser that was just dangled in front of them and then ripped away and um so i don't know why we couldn't as teachers set up our zoom so that we are lecturing to whoever's in the classroom and then you have those questions there but maybe have one of the kids that's in that classroom at the same time helping monitor that, hey, kid A, B, and C on Zoom also have questions so that you can still have that whole discussion group. So like how Mr. Turner set up his drama kids with Zoom, you could be Zooming with all the kids and trying to keep up that almost normal classroom in a not so normal situation. Yeah, I mean, there are so, there are so many, there are so many options. I wish that we were able to discuss them more openly in the board meeting. Well, and part of that is when we zoom to the board meetings, some of our hands don't get called on when they're raised. I've had it happen to me when I was sitting outside the board meeting that was very passionate before school even went back this summer. I, I was standing out with a whole group of people and the one where they let the kids go in and talk, but we let the dog go in and we had to zoom. And I was standing outside with people and going, look, can you guys see my hand raised? on the zoom as they would say that there's no other questions or there's nobody else on zoom but I can raise. i'm going my hand is raised so that's another thing that i think is a big failure is you know is, is that a glitch or are some of our voices being quieted because we might be asking the hard questions we're not trying to badmouth the district but we're asking the questions that we feel need answered or that we may not understand ourselves or someone else that's more timid is afraid to ask. Uh, I agree with you and I, I will tell you that at the last board meeting on the 14th, I had my hand raised in um, the chat room on Zoom. I actually had both open. I had the Zoom open and I had the KVGC live stream open so I could watch both and see the comments on both. But I raised my hand in the Zoom meeting and I was texting um, one of the board members at the same time. That person was asking me are you going to speak on mental health now? And I said, yeah, I'm trying to get in. And they are saying that nobody's here. And I'm here texting her, telling her, hey, please call on me. And then she said, sorry, there's no one with any questions. I have a feeling I'm not the only one. And then after that, um, with the ACOE board meeting that, that started, same thing happened. And a different person on the panel was texting me and asking me, hey, you know, you need to raise your hand. I said, it's raised. I'm sitting here waiting. And then right after that was texted to me, she said it again. Sorry, there's no one. Uh, nobody wants to. Diane, are you there? I see you. I stopped alongside the road so I could talk to you guys. And yeah, what I was oh. saying is, um, <laughs> let's try this for the third time. Um, <laughs> I found it very odd that considering some of the topics that were on the agenda, that there were no hands raised. So it's happened to me before. It happened to you that night, Dana. How many other ones, twos, tens, or fifties of people may they be having a glitch or whatnot to? Oh, I was standing right next to someone who's now a board member and he saw my hand was raised and he goes, yeah, it is, Diane. I said, and they're not calling on me. He goes, that's interesting. Yeah, very, so. very cool. You know, it, that that's one of the problems. Is that hey, we all have different opinions. And what's going on? That that's the reason why we have meetings. You don't have a meeting so you can be in an echo chamber and hear people that have the same opinion as you. You know, we're here to discuss. That's the only way that you move forward and you learn and you do the best you can possibly do is when you have differing opinions and discussion and debate. You know, just because one person doesn't like doesn't like what it has what people have to say doesn't mean that 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 person should not be in control of um the zoom actually i think maybe a parent needs to be in control of it or something but that, that's just totally ridiculous our world would be very boring if everybody agreed you know we we definitely have differing opinions and you know sometimes my opinion changes because i've listened to and learned more about a situation or 
found new evidence to back something up or to make me think differently. We can learn so much from each other if we're just willing to listen to actually listen, not just listen to respond. The pendulum will always, always swing, right? If you go too far mm -hmm. one way, it's going to swing either way. What is the purpose of doing this meeting right now and doing this little podcast? The reason why this came up is because I feel like I did not have a voice anywhere else. And I know that there are other parents and other teachers who feel like they do not have a voice. They're not allowed to speak at these meetings. They're not heard when they talk to the district office. They're not heard when they talk to their schools or and we don't really have many media outlets in in this moment. We have Ledger, we have uh, KVGC, and I mean Cam. He does his fun uh, <laughs> little newscast too, but usually alcohol's involved. We won't have alcohol on the show yet, but, um, <laughs> but <yeah. laughs> we'll get there. Trust me. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like we don't really have a voice, and I think that if we put this out. People will listen. Who knows? I mean, I, gosh, what was it? Um, we I did a video uh, a couple weeks ago on something, and within just a couple hours, we had 2,500 views. I'm like, wow, that shows me in this tiny, tiny little town. That shows me that people want to hear what's going on. They want to hear this. They want to. They want to hear what. What? Because I think there's so much growth to be had here. And that's not going to happen if everyone is silent. Some of the best compliments I've heard in the last week was, and I just wanted to say this, people have come up to me going, hey, Diane, did you catch that last board meeting? And I'm like, honestly, I said, no. I said I was really busy getting stuff done because, you know, the health department literally shut down where I work because of the amount of ICU beds. So even though we had had no COVID or anything, um, they just said they were shutting all the schools down um, over in Calaveras County because of the amount of ICU beds. So we were scrambling, we were, you know, last semester or last week for the semester for our students and we were still trying to get things out to them, things that we had had planned. So I said, I didn't get to that meeting and they're like, oh my goodness, there were board members that spoke up and there was board members that asked questions and not everything was just yes. They're like, we may actually start seeing some changes and we've got people that are asking questions and, you know, there's a glimmer within people that they're excited for the change. I mean, we've had so much change for all of us in our lives in 2020, but they're seeing the potential for growth and for change for our students that they're looking at it as a positive. Whereas before, you know, I, I haven't heard in a long time, much positives come out of board meetings and people are even, even though they were not happy about going back to distance learning right now, and they weren't happy about a lot of stuff they chose to look at the positive of the change and the new blood on the board and the potential to that, hey, we've got people that are going to be listening to the parents and going to be listening to the students. And that's not saying it wasn't happening before, but there was always such a yes board vote without the questionings in front of an audience that this has actually invigorated some people about, you know, the change that can come from this. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's time, you know. I'm really glad. Yeah, that is good that people are looking at the positive side of things, but it tells you, ah, that's really sad too. <laughs> I'm gonna look at the negative part for a minute. Yeah. But um, it, it is sad that people that know that that happened for so long. Um, we know that this, this town, not just the district, not just the city, but the county and the small little cities and everything are very big on retaliation. You know, that kind of stuff doesn't happen in a bigger city. So, <laughs> I feel y'all now too, because you know, I'm not a city girl anymore. You know. um, but yeah, it, it's a real thing. People are retaliated against and blacklisted in this town. And if you grew up here, <laughs> that, 
Don't I know it? DNA that you you kind of fall through that that game. You know, I can't say this, I can't say that because uh, you know I'll lose my job. You know, I have to be really quiet until I have tenure. I have, you know, I can't say anything yet. Um, I didn't grow up here. I don't have my DNA. I definitely speak out when I, you know, don't agree with something or if I have a question about something, I'm going to ask. I'm hoping that um, hoping that other people will start doing that too. And if I'm wrong about something, I definitely have no problem admitting it. Uh, it actually opens even more conversations, which I love. So get a little more control of the media here and, and have a bigger voice. Yeah, it's a good thing. Good thing. Um, uh, the survey also, uh, I asked, you know, what people preferred. I asked, do you prefer all children on campus at all times? Do you prefer distance learning? Um, or the option, you know, of distance learning, which was hybrid. And we had um, uh, only 27% wanted full distance learning. I, I said, I feel the quality of my child's education has, number one, declined since the pandemic, number two, improved since the pandemic, or number three, stayed the same since the pandemic. And 75% of people who took the survey said that they feel that the child's education has declined since the pandemic. Um, there was a small percentage, 9.86% uh, that said that their child's education improved during the pandemic. So. Maybe those kids thrive in a, um, you know, like homeschool setting, which is good. Maybe they found out something they didn't know before. Um, the thing that I'm most worried about, which I said before, is mental health. So I asked, you know, I am worried about my child's mental health greatly, not at all or somewhat. And uh, we had 50% say that they are greatly worried about their child's mental health. And we had 27% said they were not at all, and 22% said they were somewhat worried and I uh, found interesting that 43% of people said that they have thought about moving their child to a different district. I think that should speak volumes, and the district office should uh, listen up to that one because I know that a lot of people have moved their kids out. I would love to know how many. If we could ever find that stat out, I would love that. I don't know if anyone has any information on that one. And that, that's actually, that actually shouldn't be that hard. You, all you have to do is get last year's enrollment to this year's enrollment. Mm -hmm. That comes out on the blue sheet. I bet you I can get that number. Let me, I'm going to write that down and I'll bet you I can get that number. Okay, that would be interesting. I'm really curious. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Um, the other one okay. was mental health again. You know, I, I believe that the adults are having the mental health issues too. And, you know, there's such a huge stigma that goes along with mental health, which I hate because sometimes, you know, I gosh. There's such a high percentage of people who just have anxiety, and people who are having anxiety now that never had anxiety before with the pandemic, I think it's huge. And I, I'm still in shock that our school district has totally ignored this. Uh, the kids that are already supposed to be getting services have services. Um, and I could go into more detail on that. Like one of the questions, the adults in my household have experienced more anxiety since the changes to our school schedule were implemented. And I have a 63% said yes. So that's kind of uh, telling as well, you know, and I think that the school district needs to be worried about that. Just because they're not the students, they do affect the students indirectly. We have students having anxiety and parents having anxiety. It's going to affect work. It's going to affect education. And I think educators should be worried about the education portion of it. Um, this one was kind of sad to me because I have uh, confidence in our school board trustees. 49% said no, and only 7% said yes. 43% said I don't know. So I'm, I'm hoping that with two new board members that that will change. So we'll see if that, you know, I'll ask that same question six months from now if we get a different different view. But anyways, I thought that was a little bit interesting. If you guys have any suggestions for uh, survey questions, email them to me and I will definitely um, put them out there again. So anyways, um, does anyone have anything that they want to add to our fun little discussion today? Is that it? Mm. <laughs> 
I mean, there's so much to talk about. I mean, we, we really did talk about a lot, though. We talked about the superintendent. We talked about uh, school board meetings, grading policy. We talked about the union a little bit, you know, scheduling. So, I mean, there there's a lot. I may have missed this earlier. Um, I, in my opinion, have no... I, have, I do not see how... Diane, I'm losing you again. Diane, I'm losing you again. Okay. Diane, if you can hear me, uh, let me just see if I understood you correctly. You said you are not sure if we're going to go back to school in the first week of January because of the COVID numbers. You said our COVID numbers increased because of people traveling Thanksgiving and you feel like people are going to travel again during Christmas. I don't know if you're there or not. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me now? It's kind of, it's going in and out a little bit. Yeah. I think it comes down to it is they're sitting here saying that a lot of the new spikes are because people consider Thanksgiving. Do they not think people are going to go for Christmas and New Year's? Oh, I lost you again. Sorry, Diane, you keep going in and out. I think you're in a bad, you're in a bad spot. Yeah, can you hear me now? Oh, way better, yeah. <laughs> okay, I moved a little bit up the road. So, yeah, but yeah, I, I think that the numbers are going to increase again in January. So we may go back. I mean, our plans and what um, our administrator has told us is that to be planning to go back like we had been since, the, uh, since August, which is we have face-to-face -face with our students and we have our district distance learning students. But my thought is, is that's what we want, but that doesn't mean that that's what the health departments or some of the people that are in the next pay grade up are going to say we can do. So we have to just keep adapting and trying our hardest as teachers to make everything accessible to our students and to be there for them, not only as teachers, but as the counselors that the districts aren't hiring that sometimes these kids just need to talk to another adult outside the home or just hear a friendly voice or somebody that says, how is your day? How are you? Right. Yeah, no, you I know? Agree. You know, even with the little Wednesday club that I do, you know, we have a core group of people there. Uh, some, I have anywhere between 12 to 30 kids every Wednesday, which is interesting because I'm not a teacher. Um, but we did have some positive COVID cases. We weren't exposed there. We met on December 2nd, but we decided to take the 9th, 6th, 23rd, and 30th off. So we're not going to meet again until January. But we decided to put Zoom together too for the kids because they have built these friendships now. And I don't want to take that away from them again. They already lost their friendship wall. And so I don't want to build this new group of friends and then it gets ripped away from them again. And that, that's totally a separate issue from the fact that some of them were supposed to start kindergarten this year and they haven't even gotten to start the first school. So think about the schools that they're not going to develop this year by not being in kindergarten. It's devastating. It's absolutely yeah. devastating. How are we going to make that up? I don't know. I feel a huge responsibility with Wednesday Club, you know? I really do. Because these kids are not learning those skills. I, again, I'm not a teacher. I mean, I'm, I love science, so we do like science projects and stuff, and we do PE, and we, we do art, and I try to incorporate, you know, um, listening and following directions and that kind of stuff, and having a consistent schedule, um, just basic, basic stuff, but still, like, this is all they're getting. They're not getting any other education. Mm. I mean, imagine a five-year-old on a Zoom, uh, you know, or Google Meet, Google Classroom Meet, what are they doing? Staring at a screen, that's yeah. totally different than interacting and being hands-on. Oh, mm. Very sad. Anyways, I thank you guys so much for um, joining here. I've been trying to get this thing going forever, just to have like a different conversation. So we'll get it dialed in. And I know this sounds really like crazy, unprofessional, and scattered and unorganized, but um, that's okay. Who cares? I don't care. <laughs> We're all good. We'll figure it out. And and we'll get there. And if you guys have any ideas or anything that you guys ever want to bring up you know, in one of these little sessions, let me know. You know, I'm probably going to be doing this uh, once a week 
And it's not just about the school district. This is just one topic. Uh, I have a little YouTube channel for, called the Amador View, and I'm talking about everything in Amador County, fire politics, city, uh, you know, city council meetings, board of supervisors meetings, anything going on, any events, stuff like that. We'll, we'll be talking about everything. So if you guys have any anything you want to talk about at all, let me know, and I'll put it on the agenda. I'll just kind of rotate, you know, Every week. There's a lot of people already sad about losing dandelion days, and that also not only affects the vendors, but it affects all the different groups that help raise funds for scholarships and other things for the kids in this county. So we're already in 2020 seeing events that have been staples of Amateur County canceled for 2021. So there goes more of the hope for some of the people and the kids. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that is really sad, you know, um, and maybe, maybe at the next little meeting we have, we'll kind of talk about connections and how to connect to different people in the county to keep those nonprofits going. I'm involved in nonprofits in the county, you know, we do a lot for other people, and so just kind of trying to think about how everybody could work together. I'll just briefly tell you about one of the nonprofits I work with. I work with the Wayne the Ranch Community Fund out here in Ione and something that we're doing to try to get to try to help local businesses um, we put together this program uh, we worked with Jack Mitchell from the ledger and we're trying to get people to shop local here in Amador County and it's not just for the holiday season it actually goes through March and there's a ton of businesses that are on board with it every Friday when the paper comes out you'll see a huge a whole entire page full um, it shows every single business that is participating, and then there's like a little game card. And you take your game card, and as you shop local, you have it signed by the person behind the counter. You get, once you fill out a card that has 13 entries, you turn it in to the ledger, and we're going to do a drawing. And we're actually giving away 13, over $13,000, and the grand prize is $10,000. First, it was just going to be a thousand dollars, but by the end of our board meeting, we were like, you know what? Let's up it. Let's do something crazy. Let's do ten thousand dollars. Let's get people shopping here. So, we're hoping that that helps out, you know, a little bit. Kind of encourages people to shop local. And if you guys know anyone who owns a business and they're not participating, tell them to participate. This is a great thing that the Buena Vista Ranchery is doing, um, and Jack also from the paper. So. Uh, yeah, so that's that's, one that's awesome. Thing. Yeah, just something you know, try to get people to work together, and that is what the tribe wants to do. You know, is help the community, and so I thought it was very creative of Jack to come up with that idea and and roll with it. You know, and hey, if it works out good, maybe it will be an annual thing that we do. Yeah, why not? Be a really great thing. So. So anyways, that's just one thing that's going on. There's so much, and I could probably talk for like five hours about everything that's great that's going on here in Amos County, but I'll wait until next time to do another little podcast maybe about local businesses or something. Yeah, for me, I guess that's pretty much it for tonight, unless you don't want to add anything else. I think it's um, good. I, I had a great time chatting with you ladies. Good. Me too. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, Thank you, Dana, for yeah. the opportunity. It was great. Yeah, of course. Thanks for thanks for jumping on. There's a couple other guests on here that um, were listening, so I know you guys didn't speak at all, I can, but I can see you're there. So thank you for listening. Also, I really appreciate it. And um, I, like I said, I will go ahead and upload it to YouTube, and I'll, I'll post it on Facebook and everything so everyone will be able to see it. So. Oh, I lost you again. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, I will talk to you guys soon, okay? Okay. Good night. Okay, good night. Say goodnight. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the very first episode of the Amador View Podcast. Check us out on YouTube and Facebook. Until next time.
explosion Soon there will no longer be pollution Shining by the light of the day